What's up? I'm B, and whether you're watching this on YouTube or you were listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today we are going to be listening to another podcast episode from Brittany Dawn. Y'all asked for this. I put up a poll on my Instagram because I did an anonymous Q&A and somebody asked if I was going to keep reacting to these. I said, you decide. You be the judge. Tell me if this is what you want to do. And the overwhelming majority said yes. So here we are. This episode is called Juicy Christian Chat, Low Sex Drive, Divorce, Infidelity in Marriage, and Sexual Sin. And this is kind of like a part two because prior to this, she did one called The Reality of Christian Friendships. And in that episode, she had three of her friends come on and join the podcast, and then they answered questions that had been submitted by people who follow Brittany Dawn. And so um, I'm assuming in this, it's going to be the same girls, because in the description of this episode, Brittany says, the girls are back. Um, So I'm assuming it's the same girls. And those three are Farron Wright, and she has 101,000 followers on Instagram, and her Instagram bio says... Yeshua, fire emoji, wife and mom, creator and preacher, here to serve you in fashion, beauty, lifestyle, kingdom authority, spiritual growth, DM to collab. Second friend is Kelly Lays, and she has 3,902 followers on Instagram, and her bio says, praying nurse, travel, health, wellness, and fitness obsessed, pointing women to Jesus and affordable fashion. And last but not least, we have Emma Highslip, and she has 1,496 followers on Instagram, and her bio says, personal blog, Jesus modeling, fashion, wellness. So those are the girls who were in the last episode. I'm assuming that those are the ones who will be in this episode. If it's anybody different, I will try and find a little bit of a blurb about them so we have some context. I will say I listened to that last episode in its entirety um, just because the way that it was set up, I, I saw the title and the description and I thought, I don't think that this is one that I want to react to. I am up for reacting to episodes of Brittany Dawn's podcast, but I'm not going to react to every single one. There has to be kind of that spark um, or or something that grabs my attention that makes me say like, yes, I want to talk about this. Oh, that'll be interesting. Ooh, this could be like, this could be really valuable. I want to talk about it. And so the first one, it just, it just wasn't super attention grabbing for me, but the second one, I feel like we're going to have some good things to talk about. And so I listened to the first one in its, in its entirety and, um, it was a lot of just like, mm, yes, that's so good. Like for everything that any of them said, the response was like, oh my gosh, yes, amen. Oh, that's so good. And I'm glad that they're lifting each other up and that they're supporting each other, but I don't know. It, it, it was just interesting. Um, because it wasn't interesting. Like there was no, I don't want to say conflict, but there was no challenging of ideas. And maybe all of them do wholly and fully agree with everything that all of them say. And that's why there's no like, oh, I hear you on that. But what about this when one of them speaks? But it makes it kind of boring. If all you're doing is agreeing with each other and being like, "Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm, oh my gosh, that's so good, that's so good, everything just kind of starts to blur together. One thing that stuck out to me, however, was that I think it was Fallon who said this. It's really hard to distinguish their voices. I tried to go through their Instagrams and like get familiar with how each of them speak, but there isn't a ton of content on their Instagram pages with their own voices, and so, um, It's it's just tough. I can't tell exactly who is who when they're speaking other than Brittany because obviously I know Brittany's voice. But one of them, I think it was Fallon, said that somebody calling themselves an introvert is like speaking death over themselves. (laughs) I'll play the full clip so you can hear it, but it made me gasp out loud when she said that because that's so dramatic. She's sitting here being like, I wouldn't say that because Jesus wasn't an introvert. And, And I'm like, it's not that deep. An introvert is just somebody who recharges by spending time by themselves. It doesn't mean that they don't enjoy being around people. It doesn't mean that they can't be social. It just means that in general, they're going to um, not be as like outgoing and extroverted. Like they're not typically going to be the person to approach somebody and bring somebody in and, you know, be super comfortable in a new situation. That's not to say that that's how all introverts are, but just kind of in general as somebody who is an introvert. 
Sometimes it takes me a while to get comfortable in a new environment or a new situation. And I do require a lot of alone time in my home to recharge my energy and like make sure that I'm good. So just hearing her be so dramatic about calling oneself an introvert, I was like, ooh, that's an interesting take. Bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. How to make friends as an introvert. Just put yourself out there. Yeah, you got to. You got to. You just Mm got to rip the Band-Aid off, honey, and you just got to do it. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable. If you don't know what to say, just be honest and be like, hey, I'm an introvert. This is weird for me. Can we be friends? Or can I sit by you at church? Like, like, seriously, people love honesty. And like, if someone came up to me and was super straightforward, I'd be like, yeah, girl, come hang out with me. Like, let's go sit and chat like before service. Also, I just want to say real quick to that. Um, maybe like also take that label off yourself. Yeah. Like I think sometimes those labels can be like, so just, um, they just, they hold, hold you down. And Mm -hmm. it's like, yes, I get it. Maybe some people are a little bit more reserved, but like, maybe you shouldn't call yourself an introvert. Yeah. Like, I just feel like that's honestly speaking death over yourself in a way. Like, I mean, I get it. Some people are more um, outgoing and whatnot, but mm-hmm. I also think that can be an excuse for you to just sit and like be in a comfortable place. Mm-hmm. And it's like, do you think Jesus was an introvert? I'm just, that's it's a good point. It. No, it's a really good point. Yeah. I think as far as context for this podcast episode goes, that's pretty much all I have. If I remember anything else, I'll add it in later. Let's go ahead and do win for the week before we get into actually reacting to the episode. If you are newer around here, a win for the week is where you share something that happened to you over the past week that was good, that was exciting, that was fun, that gave you joy, that made you happy, big, small, whatever it may be, just something that you would consider a win. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can leave it in the comment section. Or if you are listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can leave it in the Q&A section for this particular episode. I do want to give a huge thank you to everyone who left their win for the week in the comment section of last week's episode, because if you watched that video, you know that I said, you know, I'm just kind of struggling this week. It's been a tough one. And if I can see good things that are happening to you, it's going to make me happy. Like it's going to put me in a better mood. And so I always love to read them. I always love hearing good things that are going on in other people's lives. But especially if I'm going through something tough, like I just, I want to hear good news. I want to hear good things happening for people. And so it meant a lot, especially last week for everybody who left their wins for the week to take the time to leave them and to share share those good things with me and with everyone else who was watching the video. It meant a lot and um, I can't wait to hear this week's win for the week from all of you and celebrate with you. My win for the week is that today I got to go to lunch with my mom and we tried a new restaurant together. It's called Culinary Gangster and it's in Scottsdale. So if you are in the Phoenix area, definitely consider giving it a shot. It has a really cool indoor outdoor space. Um, The menu is really cool because it has some interesting items, but then also some kind of like classic comfort food items. It has breakfast stuff. You can do um, like wraps, salads, bowls, burgers, stuff like that. But then they also have some unique offerings. And so I really liked the variety within the menu and the food was great and something really cool that I've never seen before is that you can bring your own wine like you can bring your own wine or your own spirits whatever you want to bring and they will provide you a glass for it and there's no uncorking fee for it so anyway I brought us some rosé to enjoy because I didn't know what either of us were going to end up ordering and I'm like I just need something that's kind of neutral that will go with a wide variety of foods and so um, I brought that We each got our food. It was so good and it was a really great time. And I loved being able to just, you know, hang out and spend time with my mom one-on-one. And so that is my win for the week. And once again, I cannot wait to hear yours and celebrate with you. Without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. Bible talks about the enemy being stealthy, right? So he's like a snake. So he just slithers in. So what my friend would always tell me is nobody is above sinning. You're listening to Chiseled and Called with Brittany Dawn, a podcast about finding freedom in imperfection and peace in your broken pieces through Jesus. Our prayer is that today's message will bless you, embolden you, and fix your gaze on the King, that it will stir up the calling God has placed within you. Without further ado, here's your host, Brittany Dawn. Welcome to the Chiseled and Called podcast. I am your host, Brittany Dawn, and I 
Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the sound? Yeah. The girls are back. <laughs> hey, y'all. <Hey. laughs> we had too much fun last week that we were like, wait, we have to do a different one this week. And we're doing a juicy, spicy, spicy Q&A. Let's go. Y'all had some really good questions. Yes. In the last episode, Brittany called these girls her best friends, but I'm pretty sure they just started posting each other on social media about a month and a half ago. I don't know if Farron, Kelly, and Mm -hmm. the other one's name, Uh, Emma, yes, Farron, Kelly, and Emma, I don't know if they were friends prior to meeting Brittany or if somehow this is all kind of like a strategic friendship group being formed here. Um, But I said this when Brittany was talking about how she has, you know, 20 brothers, 20 brothers that she can count on no matter what. And I was like, if everybody's your best friend, nobody's your best friend. That just seems disingenuous to me. I think you can meet somebody and you can hit it off and you can say like, oh yeah, we're having a great time. You know, she's a good friend and we're enjoying spending time together. But it's weird to call somebody your best friend that quickly or a group of girls your best friends that quickly because you honestly probably haven't even had time to get into conflict yet and see how it's going to play out. See how each of y'all act within the group when there's an issue or a disagreement or how they're going to respond when something bad happens to you, if they're going to be there for you, like what kind of friend they're actually going to be. You just haven't had that in a month and a half. And maybe they've been friends longer, but they weren't posting about it prior to that. And Brittany posts literally everything that goes on in her life. So just kind of an interesting thing where I'm like, okay, they're your best friends. Fine. I'll play along. But I have my own opinion. I'm trying to get used to moving this mic around. We need more microphones, dang it. Lord, provide a way. That's right. Um, Okay. Yes. So should we just jump in? Yeah. I think maybe just give – this is what I felt earlier when we were driving over here, that the Lord was going to bring freedom in two different ways. So Mm -hmm. if you are struggling with something that the Lord wants to set you free from, like if you realize like some things are not in aligned with His Word or something like that, that He's going to set you free, but also – be set free in where you have been like maybe condemned or like not even like talked about things in a way and just bring freedom in that way so that you can actually have like a marriage God designed you to have with your spouse. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. So come on, Lord. Wow. Okay. I hope y'all are ready for this. Okay. Maybe that's going to be related to the questions that are being asked because she said you can have a marriage that God intended you to have with your spouse. And in the title, they're talking about um, like infidelity and and sexual sin so maybe that's what it's related to but i'm like wow right off the bat you're just stepping in you're taking over okay girly let's go uh why isn't sex and what to expect on your wedding night when you save sex for marriage talked about in the church great question Good question Oh, I think honestly, gosh, there's so much to say about this, but i just think honestly maybe the church hasn't known like how to talk about this I guess when I'm thinking back to like talking about what to expect on your wedding night, for me, I just wasn't going to really like talk or I didn't talk to anybody about that other than maybe like chance, honestly, like my husband. So yeah, I didn't really have like a woman or I wasn't going to go to my mom be like, yeah, mom. Like awkward. And like I was 21, like I knew what sex was. We yeah. saved sex for marriage, but I like I that. knew what it was and like how to do it, if you will, just through, I guess, learning like culturally, honestly, because we didn't really talk about it much in the church. But I guess, do you you guys think, I mean, that probably is a good thing, right? To talk with like a trusted mentor or woman or mother, like about what to expect on your wedding night. Yeah, 100%. This is going to be funny. I think this is honestly going to be my first official (laughs) sex talk. Yes! I never, my mom never had one with me. What? Yes. And that's crazy. And a little bit just of like my testimony too. Like I did not grow up in a Christian home at all. So she didn't know. And, um, quickly, like I just was taken by the world. And so I actually lost my virginity at 13 and I had no idea, like no idea what to expect, no idea what was happening, no idea what would happen afterwards. And so, um, 
I just really feel that, um, am I just honor you and love that so much because now I used to feel like shame, like, Oh, well, I can't tell my children that like they have to wait if I didn't wait, but that's totally the enemy. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be so beautiful that they're all going to wait in Jesus name. Um, and I think that it's so important because it was never talked about with me. Mm -hmm. So providing that space with somebody who's trusted, who loves you that like tells you what God says about sex. Yeah. And is like, no, God created this good and beautiful in marriage. Yeah. Okay. So the first girl who was talking was Emma. I'm thinking this is Farron. And if I call her Fallon throughout this, please forgive me because I think I called her Fallon earlier. Her name is Farron um, because she has kids. And I think Kelly is single and doesn't have any kids. Um, But I, I think their experiences and what they're sharing is valid, but I don't know that it's answering the question of why doesn't the church talk about this? Why aren't we better prepared for this by our religious organizations? And if you've been watching my channel for a long time, you know what I'm going to say. It's because organized religion often builds a culture of shame around sex. And so it's, it's spoken about in a negative way far more often than not in an attempt to control people's minds. That's my opinion that's how I feel. I'm sure not every single church is like that, but I've said this before. If you can control how somebody feels about their body, you can control a lot of what they do. If you can make them feel inherently shameful for who they are, how they feel, what they think, then you have a lot of power over that person. And so um, it kind of uh, throws me off. It, it doesn't surprise me, but it's kind of off-putting to hear Farron say like I can't tell my kids you have to wait because I didn't wait no you can't tell them that they have to wait because they are their own people who make their own choices and you can have something that you want for them and you can try and like tell them um here's why in my ideal world you would choose to wait here's what I envision for your life and for your future and you know emotionally and spiritually this is what I think the impact of what I did had on me and so here's kind of why I would love for you to um, be discerning in your physical intimate relationships and you know if, if mom has her way you know I would love for you to save it until marriage because then you can have the special relationship with your spouse, whatever. Like you can, you can say that I, I would like this thing to happen and you can have conversations with your kids about it, but like, you can't just tell them like, you have to wait because you don't get to make that choice for them. And telling people that, telling people like, you don't have an option. You don't get to think about it. We don't have, we don't get to have nuanced conversations about it. This is what it is. Leads to a lot of complicated emotions and complex feelings and I think it does more harm than good because it's it's just like you're telling me I have to do this thing and if I don't do this thing then I'm wrong but even if I do do this thing which is waiting until marriage to have sex then after I have sex everything you told me about who I was as a virgin no longer applies to who I am now and who am I if I'm not a virgin and like it it can cause you to kind of spiral out so just my two cents on that phrasing of like, I can't tell them they have to wait if I didn't wait. And also, um, I hope they get into talking about like church culture and not just specifically their own experiences with this question. Although I don't know how long they're going to spend on the question. That's so good. I don't know. I feel like this is such a double question. There's so much in it, but, um, I have a similar testimony, uh, Well, I mean, I guess it's really, yeah, it is similar. Um, I did grow up in a, in a home that was, um, we went to church or whatever. So we would say that we were Christians, but, um, for me, I found porn very, very early on and it was just scrolling through television. And so I knew what sex was and I knew how to do it just from unfortunately learning from the impurity on the television. And so I lost my virginity very young as well. And so I already knew what it was. And I actually cried the first time I had sex because I knew I wanted to wait until it was, it was so weird because it was this shame thing of like, 
you know, I'm watching porn and I'm addicted to porn and masturbation because it was just shown to me when I was so young. And Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, if it was hidden, there was nothing wrong with it, you know? And then when I was 13, uh, my boyfriend talked to me into having sex with him and we did. And I cried. And I remember him being like, why are, why are you crying? And I'm like, I just wanted to save this for marriage. And he's like, well, it's okay because we're going to get married. But in the depths of my soul, I knew, I knew that I knew that I wanted to wait. Um, and so I really do wish the church talked about that more because I sat in shame and then I just kept everything a secret from then on out because there weren't people in the church that were talking to us about it. All I ever heard growing up was don't have sex till you get married. That's wrong. And I'm like, well, I wish someone would have explained why it's wrong and the beauty behind it because God designed it for husband and wife to become one. And when you do that with many other people, you're joining yourself, becoming one with all these other people. So little people pieces of your heart are just being broken and given away to each person that you have sex with. So, um, yeah, we need to do a better job and at the church to talk about this more because it's such a tender topic. Yeah. Well, my thing, I feel really bad hearing that she cried when she, um, had sex for the first time and that it wasn't how she wanted it to happen. And she felt bad, like immediately after that makes me feel really, really sad for her. Um, But I am glad that she brought up, like, we need to be more okay talking about this within the church and having more open conversations because that's what I was harping on pretty much right before she said that. So I am glad that she brought that up. As to, like, the world is already talking about it, so why are we not? Yeah. Like that's right. the world that's is right. teaching our children what sex is. Yes. And they're not going to stop because yeah. there's such an agenda behind that. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. You know, the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy mm-hmm. us at a young age. That's my testimony. That's your testimony. Mm-hmm. And it's like we should be speaking up about these things in the church, yeah. in small groups, in youth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like I specifically don't remember a single time in youth where this was ever talked about or even remotely mentioned. Yeah. And because of that same thing, like it led me to a lot of curiosity. Mm-hmm. My testimony, y'all know this, like I started struggling with masturbation because I was sexually exposed at a young age. Yeah. And so yeah. that curiosity, the enemy took that seed that was planted yes. yeah. and it led me down a destructive path mm-hmm. that I struggled with. I mean, it only got worse and worse yes. and worse mm-hmm. until I was like, what, 28, 29, yep. when the Lord broke me free of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like I could have been saved of so much heartbreak yes. had someone just told me, right. this oh is why oh we wait for marriage. Yes. This is why. Do you hear what I'm talking about, though, where it's like, oh, my gosh, yes, mm-hmm. yes, oh, wow, yes. <laughs> it's just like a, it's a chorus of agreements in the background. we don't want to sleep around. We want to prevent soul ties. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. Like those are real issues Mm -hmm. that no one talks about because sex is not sex. It's a emotional, spiritual act. It's not just physical worship. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure, it's physical and it's fun, yeah. but like it's so much more than just a one night stand right. or just a hookup. You right. know, it's mm-hmm. you're tying your soul mm-hmm. to that person. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's like if that was talked about and if I was told that at a young age, I probably would have thought twice totally. before opening myself up to those things. Right. Yes. And so, yeah, that's that's my take is like if the world is talking about it, yeah. we should be too. Yeah. I think even going into just a little bit more depth of what that means, like tying your soul to somebody. Mm-hmm. So that means that if a person that you have had sex with struggles with anxiety, struggles with depression, mm-hmm. you are going to so struggle good. with those things because your soul is tied so to them. Good. And nobody ever told me that. And so here I am wondering why all of this stuff was happening so to good. me. And I had no idea because I was taking on what was happening Come in that on. other person. Yeah. And especially since we know it's out of like the image of God, then um, the enemy has no problem. Yeah like bringing all that in. And that's like, we have to understand the spiritual of what happens. Yeah, totally. And Brett, I just, I don't know. I feel led for you. to Soul ties. I think it's funny that they're talking about soul ties because every exposure I have had to that topic has come from a new age or manifestation or spiritual resource or influencer or book, as opposed to coming from somebody on the religious side. And Bernie Dawn is constantly posting about how people in 
um, like mainstream music are witches and yoga is demonic and like all of these new age spiritual things are bad and should be shunned and yet we're gonna pick and choose a few of these things that we're that we can embrace because we can twist it for our own narrative. So I think it's funny that we're using that phrase and we are talking about the concept of soul ties. To be honest, I kind of flip flop. Like I go back and forth on whether or not I believe that soul ties are a real thing. Um, but I, but I can say that if soul ties are a real thing, I don't think they would apply specifically to sexual relationships. I think um, if energy is infinite and energy can be transferred, then you could potentially create a soul tie with anybody, with anyone that you have an interaction with or a close relationship with or that you bump into on the street. Like if energy is transferable and it never gets destroyed, then in theory, if if I if I'm believing in soul ties and that soul ties exist, it's not just a strictly sexual thing. And it seems kind of um, reductive to say that soul ties are exclusively related to sexual activity. So that's where my thought process is at right now. At some point in the future, it could certainly change. And if it does, and the topic comes up again, and I have a different opinion, I'll say like, I have a different opinion now, here's what it is. Um, but for right now, that's how I feel about it. To kind of share because I know about your past and then obviously like you uh, becoming one with Jordan. Mm -hmm. I remember I was so excited to just ask like, what was that like? You yeah. know, um, can you just share like for mm -hmm. the girl at the end, it says, yeah. what, what can I expect when mm -hmm. I save that for marriage? Yeah. I think I was really worried because, you know, obviously mm -hmm. I had did not save sex in general and, but with Jordan I did. And I think I was really worried that it was going to be awkward or, you know, there's always, this is a juicy Q and A we're being honest. Yeah, like yeah, there's, there's totally. questions like about things, body parts, like you're just right, curious right, that right. you don't really know. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of like, okay, well, I'm just truly trusting the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's different for every couple, right? Like we've heard stories where they get to the other side of marriage and they're like, oh crap, like this is a problem, mm -hmm. you know? But for me and Jordan. It, it was truly a blessing. Um, it wasn't awkward at all. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. It truly felt the most, it was the most freeing moment wow. I've ever had in the bedroom. And like, even in my past marriage, I never had that. Wow. I never felt that because we were living in sin, right. you know, in such darkness. And so to be able to like look back and say the wait was worth it and not just because like, oh, wow, we can check that off the list. We completed right. this task. We did it. Right. It's like, no, the Lord blessed it tenfold. And because of that, it felt like we, it's hard to put into words. Like you just become one flesh and, you know, everyone there's like, we were talking before this, there's people that are like, well, you were living in sin because you've been divorced. I don't agree with that. No. I don't agree with that. I think that, you know, if you just lose feelings for someone and that's why you get divorced, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> love is not feelings, yes. right? Love is a choice. Yeah. But I think there are certain circumstances where I'm... I hate hearing her use a phrase that I myself have used sincerely, um, that phrase being love is a choice. <laughs> but hey, I'm glad that Brittany and I have found something that we agree on because I have literally said that on this channel where... Um, you know, attraction is obviously a feeling and the, the initial parts of a relationship, I think, are truly based on like feelings and emotions. But the further into a relationship you get, and especially once you enter into a marriage, it is choosing every single day to love your spouse and to show them love and to work on being the best person that you can be for them and making sure that they know that you value and appreciate them and continually adding into your relationship so it gets stronger and stronger and that doesn't just happen because of emotion that happens because of choices and intention so Britt you and I we're on the same page for once like that is not what Jesus would choose for his daughter and that yeah. is my out and so I think even the Lord healed me from that mm -hmm. in a way which was really weird I didn't expect that right? Wow. Like you don't expect to be healed of like layers of trauma, yeah. but that's how powerful sex is. Yeah. Like it can yeah. heal in a moment when you're doing it the right way. Yeah. And okay. just, yeah. I mean, I could go down a whole, whole rabbit hole, whole rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could go down a whole thing about that. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, the, the biggest 
moment was like, it was the most freeing night of my life. And there weren't worries about body image or being judged or is he going to leave me if he doesn't get what he wants? Like literally I remember Jordan was like, Hey, if you don't want to yet, like if you need the night, that's okay. We have our whole honeymoon. And I was like, no, uh, I'm ready to go. (laughs) I was like, I'm not waiting. (laughs) I'm not waiting another night, but it's just like, even that him saying that was like, wow, he's really marrying me because he loves me, not for my body. And that hadn't been the narrative for a long time. Yeah. And so I don't know if that answers the question. That's so sweet. I I just, I get so excited for those of y'all that don't know. I I am single and I (laughs) have been saved. Yes, Lord, send that one man. (laughs) Okay, so that's Kelly. I'm going to try and ingrain her voice in my brain so I can distinguish who's speaking. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I have been purifying myself for over six years and that's like all my friends are now married and I, that is like, I get so excited. I'm like, you know, tell me how was that night for you? You know, cause I, I anticipate that. I hope for that. I'm expectant for that. And you know, a lot of my friends, they literally hardly have no words because it's something that's happening. That's so supernatural where the two become one, like we can't even explain it. And so, um, just hearing from my friends, they're like, it was so pure. It was so holy. It it was worship. Like I've had friends that say, you know, we we just prayed right before, or you know, we put on worship music before. The Holy Spirit told us to do communion before, or like, mm-hmm. you know, or like okay. just they're speaking in tongues as they're you know having sex, and I'm just like, wow, I can't even imagine that because my whole life that I've known of sex has been so impure, yeah. but it literally makes me weep to think that, wow, yeah. that's how God designed it. So yeah. sis, just whoever you are yes. who asked that question, yes. be so expectant that it's going to be pure. It's yeah. going to be holy. It's going to yeah. be the most beautiful thing you've ever experienced, the most intimate thing that you can experience with your husband and the Lord. Amen. I feel like... Okay. So two thoughts. First, when I was looking through Kelly's Instagram, it definitely reminded me a little bit of Bethany Beal from Girl Defined, um, just really focusing on like so much of her posts being about being single and like being in a waiting period and a waiting season and looking for a godly man and a godly husband. And so um, Bethany definitely talks about that a lot and seeing Kelly talk about it, it's like, oh, y'all are kind of like two sides of the same coin. I don't know how I want to phrase it. Um, Bethany's like, cheesy in a lot of the things that she does and I'm not saying that in like a negative way please hear me because like cheesiness is great I love it good for her I mean I don't like I don't agree with a lot of the things that Bethany says but I don't judge her for being cheesy like I kind of love how unapologetically cheesy she is so I'm not saying it in a negative way um but she's a little bit more cheesy and Kelly seems a little bit more savvy and so it is really it's like two sides of the same coin you remind me of each other, but there's a distinct difference in how your um, social media feeds are set up. So it's just kind of interesting. And then as far as people speaking in tongues while having sex, everyone is free to believe whatever they want about speaking in tongues. But the Bible does say that if someone is speaking in tongues, there should be another believer there to interpret what they are saying. And so if it's um, just the two of y'all engaging in sex, I don't know. Is one of you speaking in tongues and the other interpreting? Are you both speaking in tongues at, at the same time? Because the Bible tells us that you don't do that. If multiple people are there speaking in tongues, they should go one at a time. So that way the interpreter can interpret what is being said. Um, so I don't know if like one of them was speaking in tongues and the other was interpreting it for themselves or again, logistically and biblically. I don't know how that lines up, but okay. I mean, I, I believe in the legitimacy of speaking in tongues, but I think people put on dramatics at times. I don't think that Spirit-led speaking in tongues happens genuinely as frequently as people like Brittany and her friends and other influencers like this say that it does. People in the charismatic church like Hannah Williamson and, you know, Brittany and her friends, they talk about it like this is something that happens all the time. Or like, you know, I was doing my daily prayer and I just started praying in tongues and this is not the first time it's happened, but, you know, it was really strong today. It's like, I don't think that happens as frequently 
in a genuine way as you're telling me that you're doing it. I just don't. And and maybe that's a blind spot in my faith, but that that's how I feel about it. I've never um, met another Christian in my real life who speaks about speaking in tongues as much as Brittany posts about it or as much as certain religious influencers post about it. Like, um, I love like all of our different stories and how beautiful it is. And I think that's so beautiful. I was talking with a girlfriend the other day and I'm like, I want to bring back like redemption marriages because Mm -hmm. my husband and I got married over seven years ago and we were not filled with the Holy spirit yet. And so, um, our wedding was a huge party. It like the Lord was not honored in it at all. And, um, now our beliefs just have completely changed and I want a different wedding like with the Lord. And so I either at like our 10 year or 20 year, we're going to have like, um, a a bow renewal and make it all about him. Oh my gosh. And then I want to do the same thing, but I want to be like, um, like fast from sex. Um, yeah. and then so that we can have that moment, like wow. the Lord redeems really everything. Nice. What a good idea. It is really, wow. really beautiful. That's Cause so I want it his way. I don't want it the way that I did it. I want it his way. So, That's so cool. wow. What about you, Emma? Honestly, that sounds kind of cool. I know people tend to do vow renewals at like 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it may be. But to be intentional and say like, here's how we got married the first time. And our values have changed over the years. And so I do want to um, honor God and the holy matrimony that we are living in. And I want to celebrate in a way that is spiritually meaningful to us. I think I think that's sweet and it's intentional. And I think that's cool. Good for them. What was that like? I yeah. mean, I'm just listening to to what you're saying, Farron. I think that sounds so sweet. Um, Chance and I did save ourselves for marriage, but if I'm being honest, we didn't save everything. Like we saved it. It was like everything minus like intercourse. You it's know what hard. I'm saying? So yeah. we weren't perfect. Yeah. So it was like technical virginity, which again is something that I've spoken about when I was doing another Brittany Dawn reaction, where it's like. Where, where are you drawing the line of purity? Are you being legalistic in the functions that you are performing? Or is it a matter of your heart? Or your, like, where, what, what determines purity? Well, purity culture is so propped up and staying a virgin until your marriage is so important. And it's like plastered all over and it's ingrained in your brain ever since you're a kid. If you grow up in most Christian churches, but it's, it's literally not talked about in enough nuance to say like is it just penis and vagina like that's that's the ta- that's the breaker of my purity or is it other things are we doing everything else like is everything else acceptable except for this one thing and if so why because it's it's a matter of mechanics like if you are not to be graphic um but if you're performing oral sex on somebody that's still one body part going into another and so what makes that different than vaginal intercourse and why does it matter and like that's why I want to have more open and less judgmental conversations about these kinds of things because she just proved my point she just said we did everything except that and I'm willing to bet that they're not the only couple who falls under that category um and that's okay (laughs) yeah but do I sometimes wish maybe we would have like not even like, yeah. I hear yeah. people not even like kissing. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. There's just like, I think the convictions are kind of different for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Um, but wedding night was awesome. That was the first mm-hmm. time we had sex. And to be honest, we we're both really tired. <laughs> I mean, okay. speaking in tongues while well, uh, sex, <laughs> dang Kelly, you said that. I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> right? We didn't even know how to <laughs> Um, but we were like, definitely like, let's go. It was fun. And it was quick because we were freaking tired and we went to bed. I but lie. it was great. Um, and I do think the Lord. De- I wonder if she said that genuinely or if she's like, yeah, they were speaking in tongues. Okay, Kelly. <laughs> if it's like a subtle way of calling that out. Of like, mm-hmm, yeah, I'm sure that happened. Definitely. Um, like has a, a special blessing when you choose yeah. to wait. That's not to say that there's not redemption. Hundred percent. I mean, I love the idea of going back, like, and renewing your vows. I mean, I think that's something like everybody should do as mm-hmm. they grow in their walk with the Lord. Because Chance and I've been married for five years this December, and we've grown on all fronts, including intimacy and sex and oneness. I think yeah. that's like the, that's right. the thing uh-huh. that I love most about. 
<laughs> sex and just about being married is the true like one and united front that you are. And it's like you and the Lord against the world. And that's all you need. Mm -hmm. And, um, sex is just a part of marriage and sex is a beautiful part of marriage. And also just to be even more transparent, like set, uh, chance had a sexual past, you know, he, um, was like a Christian his whole life, but really didn't like step into, um, being that man of God until, um, a co- really a couple years before we met. So I was a virgin going into it, not a perfectly clean slate, but I never had sex. Um, and then he had had sex like his whole life and girlfriends that he lived with and all that stuff. So, um, what was beautiful is that didn't hinder or make yeah. anything awkward or uh-huh. weird. It was just uh-huh. beautiful. And it's not something that like I ever felt I needed to hold over his head or I never even felt weird about it. Cause I knew that the Lord had forgiven him. Yeah. And like, even you said in the last um, podcast, he cast it into the sea That's of forgetfulness. Right. That's right. Totally. So it yeah. didn't even, it wasn't even a thing. And so, That's um, yeah, I love how we all have different stories yeah. and yeah. hopefully that gives people hope. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. I feel like there were a lot of little things in what Emma I'm getting better at kind of figuring out who they were um, that Emma just said that kind of um, triggered like different thoughts and different kind of tangents that we could go down. I'm trying not to address every single thing because I feel like if I do, it's going to make this video so incredibly long and I don't want to make it like unbearably long for you. But just now I'm hearing certain things. I'm picking up on them. I'm internalizing them. And if it becomes um, pertinent to bring them up later. I will. I will do that. Like so many people can relate to that because I've gotten that question a lot is like, I'm a virgin, but my fiance isn't like, how do I not let this get in my head? And that's so, I think it's so beautiful that you just opened up and shared that. That's going to help someone yes. so much. Come on. Um, okay. So the next one is kind of long, but I think this is really important to touch on. Y'all actually haven't seen this question yet. Oh, so. No, because it's anonymous like and I wanted to keep it anonymous. Okay. Um, I'm ashamed, but I had an affair and everything came to light about it a little over a month ago. I was in such a dark place and far from Jesus and the man it was with was emotionally and sexually abusive. Mm-hmm. My husband wants to separate and I move into a home with a family from church on Thursday. I want to fight for my marriage and I want to fight for my husband. I have had a full 180 with God and I realize why I strayed so far from him. Mm -hmm. And so I want my husband to have the Christ following wife that he deserves, but I don't know what to do. The church never talks about the side of an affair. No one from my church has given me counsel or guidance. Maybe this is what this family is for, who I am moving in with. I'm not sure. I have surrendered it all to God's will, but I'm just struggling hard and hurting in the waiting. Mm. Oh, sis. Yeah. My heart broke for her when I read that. Um, I don't even know where to start. I will say this, like there's nothing outside of God's redemption. Totally. Amen. I've yes. seen him yes. redeem totally, yes. and restore marriages that yes. you would never expect to be yep. fixed and restored. Yep. Yep. And so I want to say that to encourage you not to lose hope yeah. yes. that God can redeem anything. Yes. Yeah. Especially with a pure heart. Yes. Oh. Yes. And a surrendered heart a surrendered and, heart. and just truly repenting yes. and turning yeah. from that sin. Yes. Um, I think, I, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I keep hearing the verse that says, with God, all things are possible. Mm-hmm. And I just want to first thank you for being so brave yeah, to like yes. write Brittany that because yeah. I know that that was scary yeah. to to admit yeah. and just, just reach out. So I want to thank you. Something that I'm picking up on, but I don't know the significance of just yet, is um, I'm frequently hearing them say, I'm hearing or I'm being prompted or I'm being called like how she just said like I'm hearing this verse instead of oh it makes me think of this verse that says you know through Christ all things are possible and so I wonder what the purpose and intention is of phrasing it as I keep hearing as opposed to that makes me think of this verse or that reminds me of this verse or you know or something along those lines. So just something I'm picking up on and I'm going to keep paying attention to. 
for that. And thank you for sharing. And, um, I'm so sorry. I can't even imagine how painful, um, this season of your life has been. And you know, what's wild is, um, the very, one of like the, the first or second Christian friends God ever sent me was a woman who I love so dang much. Um, but she actually had an affair on her husband and they were in church and they were in ministry. And I just always looked at her and I was always like, dude, like, how did you do that? Like, because, you know, in my mind, I always have said, I will never cheat. I will never cheat. But it's like, listen, when you're in, like, nobody intends on that, right? Nobody ever says I do. And they're like, oh yeah, I want to cheat on my spouse. Like, here's the thing. We live in a spiritual world and the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came so that we could have abundant life. And the Bible talks about the enemy being stealthy, right? So he's like a snake. So he just slithers in. So what my friend would always tell me is nobody is above sinning. Like nobody is above adultery. Like nobody is above these affairs. And I would always like get really irritated when I would hear her say that. Cause I'm like, well, yeah, you can just choose to not do that. But I just, I honestly, I've been humbled since then. You know, I didn't walk in your shoes. I don't know what it was like. And I just know that, um, the deceiver is stealthy. And so (laughs) I just really pray right now that you would be freed from any and all shame, guilt, and condemnation, Holy Spirit, that you would touch this girl and that you would free her from any of that and that she would just walk in such a beautiful, fresh, um, just identity of who she is as a daughter and who she is as a forgiven, beloved daughter, Lord, and that she could just forgive herself, that she would give her grace to forgive herself. Um, So I I just, I don't know, I felt led to share that with you um, and that just know that you're not alone. I think it's beautiful that Jesus has just given you this family um, to just love on you and help you through this season. And um, yeah, with God, all things are possible. I love that. I am going to piggyback off of that. Um, What I feel like the Holy Spirit invites us into is letting us become the wife that we were meant to be. And so if your husband, like the Lord can work on his heart. Like if anything is possible, like you said. And so, um, and it's just so beautiful to see the men, um, say like, well, you know, take ownership for their part. Like, was Mm -hmm. I loving like you well? Um, Mm -hmm. and so obviously we don't know details, but my like number one piece of advice would be be that wife now. So even if there is not, um, like it looks like right now, a chance of him coming back, be that wife now, pray over him now, fast for him now, like pray. And, um, even like write to him now of like, just what the Lord has been doing in your heart. And like, I pray that the Lord restores your marriage, but if not, then you are going to be a, um, wife, um, with the Lord, like you're going to be at the bride of Christ and there's nothing better than that as well. And so, um, he's going to put you into this season and show you if you had never been shown what it's like to be a godly wife. Um, and I just, I truly believe in restoration too of the family unit. So we're definitely partnering with that over you. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I hear about someone having an affair and like it being found out and trying to come back from it, I have a million and one questions because that's just not something that my brain comprehends easily. So I already like even about this anonymous question that I know I have no way of getting follow up information on. I'm like, hold on, like what happened with this? What about that? How did this happen? How did this lead to that? Like, I have all of these questions swirling around in my head. But Something that I do want to point out is I think that it is very nice that they're being very gracious to this woman and they are encouraging her and praying over her and being like, God can redeem you and all of this stuff. But it's kind of interesting that they would say, and maybe your husband can think about the things that he did wrong. Because I don't know that they would be asking that same question or making that same statement if it was a husband who had had an affair and the wife was faithful. And I don't like that. Again, I think I don't know what the husband did or didn't do. I don't know how he behaved or didn't behave. But according to how this person asked the question, um, it seems like this was something that she was struggling with. It was um, a choice that she had made based on what she was going through personally and not as a result of something that was being done to her or as a result of an unfulfilled need. And now that it's been found out, she wants to be a wife to her husband and she doesn't mention her husband needing to change anything. And so it's just like, 
automatically you're going to go to like, and maybe your husband can think about what he could do differently. Yeah. All I, all I hear is just redemption. Yeah. I just, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I weep with you and I'm sorry. And, um, I think there is hope. And, um, if it's not good, God's not done. Yeah. You're yeah. still alive. You're still breathing. You're here. And I love your vulnerability. Um, and I just think there's going to be a redemption. And I really do feel like there's going to be something with this family yeah. that you're um, going to move in with. And it's going to be okay. So Yeah. And I just declare that what the enemy uh, yes. meant for evil, yes. that God yes. will use right. for good Amen. in Jesus' name. We just speak unity over this family. We yes. just speak health and healing over this family. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give that husband such a heart of mercy yeah. for his wife. That you would give him yes. such a heart of grace and forgiveness, that you would help that man forgive yeah. her, Lord, yes. and yeah. that you could fix what only you could fix in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, sis. Yes. Amen. Okay, the next one, which I feel like we kind of already touched on this, but we didn't really go into it. What does the Bible say about divorce? Shall I start? Yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot of scriptures we could go into. We were actually talking about this before we started recording because there's a lot in the Old Testament. There's a lot in the New Testament. We are under the new covenant because Jesus came and paid the ultimate price for our sins. So it's tough because you could reference all, right? My, and again, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people that hold my past over my head. How could you be in this marriage? You're a divorcee, you should be living in, you know, you're living in sin basically. And I'm like, my personal. I'm really curious who's saying that to her. Is it people in her life? Is it people that she knows personally? I can't say that I have ever seen someone comment on like a YouTube video or on her Instagram that her new marriage is her living in sin, that her and Jordan being married is them living in sin because she was married before. And so I don't know if this is like a narrative that she's making up in her own mind and presenting to us as if it's true, um, as to, to use as like a talking point because she's a religious influencer or if people are actually saying that to her, but I've never seen it. So like, is it legit people in your real life that you know, just coming up to and being like, you know, you're living in sin because you should have never gotten divorced, right? I could imagine maybe one or two snarky people making a comment like that. But for Brittany to talk about it like it's an everyday occurrence is just not tracking in my mind conviction and my personal belief, this isn't even just a conviction. This is what I truly believe my father would say is there are certain situations in marriages that that is not God's will for his daughter. Abuse. There's a lot of different categories of abuse we could go into. That is not something that God would tolerate for his daughter. And that's kind of my story. I've obviously never shared that, nor do I have any desire to, but That's just my personal belief. Now, if you're just getting divorced because you lost feelings for the person, love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. You're going to have ebbs and flows in marriage. I mean, gosh, Jordan and I go through ebbs and flows where I'm like, dang, he's really just annoying me this week. (laughs) And I him, right? Like he, I know I can be annoying. I am a chatty Kathy at 2 a.m. when he wants to sleep. (laughs) We get our midnight zoomies in my... (laughs) He's like, does this girl ever stop talking? And so I know I annoy him, right? But like love is not a feeling. And if you rely on your feelings, you're never going to be married for longer than a few weeks or a few months, right? So it is. It's a choice. So I don't know. What do y'all think? As you were sharing that, I literally feel like the Lord gives us wisdom when we ask. So like when we ask him, Lord, what do I do? He will tell you because he knows the guy's heart and he knows what's going to happen. He knows every decision he's going to make, like the Lord knows. And so if you are in a relationship that is abusive um, and the Lord knows he's not going to change, you will feel a peace to leave. Like I I just, I strongly feel that. But uh, again, you know, if I'm wrong, then 
this is just so hard. It's it a really hard, I think it's kind of a gray area. I mean, we know you can literally Google what does yeah. the Bible say about divorce? Yeah. There's so many scriptures. It's obviously not God's will. It's not his yeah. desire. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's obviously so painful when people get divorced because what was one is now not one anymore. Mm-hmm. Like we understand that that's not God's will. And if you have had a divorce, I just pray that you don't feel yeah. shame, guilt, or condemnation mm-hmm. um, because no one is perfect and marriage is very hard. Right. Um, but I, I don't know. I just think that, um, there are certain circumstances like the Bible talks about, um, adultery. Yes, you can leave, right. If you, if your spouse has cheated on you. Um, but I've also seen and heard beautiful stories of redemption where a spouse cheated and guess what? The other spouse chose to stick it out and fight Mm -hmm. for their marriage. Yeah. Because the enemy is after marriage. Yeah. He hates marriage because it's the actual image of Christ. It's a form of ministry. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so he hates that. So what mm-hmm. is he going to do? He's going to try to um, interfere with marriages. Yeah. And so I think it's beautiful when that other person is willing to humble themselves and say, you know what, God, I'm hurting and this is awful, but I'm willing to like give it a shot. And that's only if the person who cheated is repented, right? Yeah. If that person doesn't want to change and they just want to keep cheating and having affairs, like that's a totally different story. Like that's straight abandonment and that's yeah. total grounds for divorce, right? Um, but I just just think that for sure you just you always want to seek counsel so it's something like this because it's very multifaceted yeah i actually don't really have an issue with any of their answers there so so that's cool like in my head i was thinking about um like what i would say to somebody who is religious and asking that like what the bible says about divorce or what um biblical grounds would be for divorce because of course If you are not Christian and you do not subscribe to these beliefs, I am not saying that this is how you have to live your life, but just talking to people who are under the same faith system, like the first three things that pop into my head are abuse, adultery, and abandonment. And as soon as she said like abandonment, I'm like, okay, we're all kind of on the same page here. Um, You know, like Brittany said, marriages are going to have ebbs and flows. I think they will have ups and downs. You'll go through tough times. You'll go through triumphant times and joyous times, but not every day is going to be the most amazing thing that you've ever experienced. And if you do take your marriage vows seriously and you are honoring your marriage as a covenant, then it it should be truly for better or for worse. However, like they're discussing and, you know, this aligns with what I believe, if it's a case of abuse, adultery, or abandonment, you don't need to feel bad for leaving. You don't need to feel like you are sinning or breaking God's design for your life or going against his will by leaving that relationship because clearly that person is not honoring and respecting you and so you're not in a healthy environment and that's not what God would want for your life, so... We are on the same page here. I'm I'm glad for that, at least. Like, we can have different opinions on a lot of different things. But when it comes to something as serious as this and somebody potentially being in an unhealthy or unsafe environment and saying, like, it's okay for you to go, I'm glad that um all five of us were on the same page. Well, it's like, look at the woman at the well, yeah. right? Like, she was, she had six husbands, right? Is that correct? A Jesus lot. said a lot. A lot, you, a lot of you them. You have many husbands. Many, many. Yeah. <laughs> and he still used her, yeah. encountered mm-hmm. her, showed himself as the Messiah to her. Yeah. And she went on. And she was she, the first evangelist, right? Yeah. yeah. She went on to bring so many people to Christ. Yeah. Totally. So it's like, even if you are on the other side of a divorce yeah, right. and you're carrying that shame, like surrender that to the Lord. That shame is not from God. That's right. Yeah. And he wants to do a powerful thing with your testimony. He can redeem anything just right. like we were talking about every, nothing is outside of God's grace. Yeah. The next question I'm trying to roll. Yeah. Through. Just adding biblical context for curious minds. I'm not trying to go against anything that Brittany said in that. Um, but again, she like threw out like, Oh, the woman at the well, as if everybody was going to know who that was. And maybe you do know who that is. And maybe, The majority of her followers will know who that is. But in case you don't know, when they say the woman at the well, they are referring to a story from the Bible where Jesus was traveling with some of his disciples and um, they had approached a well around midday. The disciples went further into the town and Jesus decided to stay there where he encountered a Samaritan woman. And just 
in general, Samaritans and Jews would not have been buddy-buddy. They would not have been interacting. Like, they... Unlikely pairing, right? And so we're midday in a really hot region of the world in the Middle East, and this woman is coming to the well by herself. And so from just considering those things, we know that this woman doesn't have community because most people are not going to the well to draw water by themselves midday because it's the hottest time of day. And so most people went in the morning or in the evenings and they went together. It was like a communal activity. And so um, again, this woman is an outcast. She doesn't have community. She's going in the middle of the day, so she doesn't have to interact with other people. So anyway, Jesus ends up engaging in conversation with her where he essentially asks her to get him some water from the well. And she's like, why are you talking to me? You're Jewish. I'm Samaritan. You guys typically don't associate with us. He tells her, if you knew who was asking you, you wouldn't ask me that question. Instead, you would ask me how to get living water so you might never be thirsty again. This intrigues her. She wants to know more about this living water. He tells her, go home, get your husband, bring him back here. And I'll tell you guys. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right, because you've been married multiple times and the person that you're living with now is not your husband. And so then it launches into this conversation about how he must be a prophet and like he knows everything about her and how could he know this when he just met her and they talk about God and um, she's just like, I believe the Messiah is coming who, who will know everything and who will deliver the news of God. And he basically says like, that's me. I'm the Messiah. I'm that one. I'm the person like I can give you the living water and I can give you access to eternal life. And so then after that, she proceeds to go and tell everybody like she can't keep it in of this guy like he's legit. He knew everything about me without me telling him. And so that's why they called her like the first evangelist. And, um, you know, because she just went and spread the news of Jesus Christ of Nazareth being the Messiah. So. Now that I've given the whole story, I feel like I probably could have just read it directly from the Bible and it would have taken like the same amount of time. Um, but hey, B. Haney's summaries. Hope you enjoyed it. I know. Because I'm like, oh, we've been recording for a hot minute already. Okay. Song of Solomon. That's it. That's the topic. Uh, that was the question. <laughs> what did we say? That's a deep one. The spiciest, spiciest book Spicy. in the Bible. Okay, guys, if you haven't read the Song of Solomon in the Passion Translation, it is oh, an yeah. absolute must. And you just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Um, obviously, it's kind of very confusing, the book, but I just think it's beautiful if yeah. you actually do read it in the Passion because it'll just kind of help you understand it more. So the book is allegorical. So it's, a, it's an interpretation um, okay. for God's love for the Israelites. So like when allegory not literal one point for whoever this is talking i'm gonna say it's farron is it farron i don't know but in any case yes uh song of solomon or song of songs they're kind of interchangeable i would consider that to be poetry and not necessarily a story of like historical fact you read it, it really is going to basically show you his love for you. Um, and so I love it. It is weird. Some of, some of the things are weird in there. Um, but the meat of it is beautiful and it just shows how, um, Jesus is so after us and he loves us so much. So yeah. I would read it in the passion. I, just, I love this. It even says in my Bible, um, song of songs is an indication of God's blessing on the physical union of man and woman. Mm -hmm. God created us for each other yes. and we should delight in physical intimacy within the context of marriage that God has sanctioned for us. Ooh, love that. I know. Beautiful. Wow. So beautiful. Yeah. Come on, beautiful. spicy Emma. Yeah, I think y'all got it. It's a good but Yeah, it is good. I think I read it in like one night because it is very interesting. Um, once you read it, you'll kind of find yourself continuing to read it. So yeah. definitely do that. And I think it is a beautiful picture of a husband and wife. Um, and even more so what Kelly was saying, God's love for us. I was telling Farron before the podcast, sometimes I do kind of struggle to um, see it as God's love for us because it's kind of weird verbiage. So that's just me being. It's interesting to me. I think I'm seeing a little bit of disagreeance without actually having a disagreement without actually like vocalizing. I, I think that your perspective is wrong here um, because that was Emma, if I'm correct. 
who said, you know, it's kind of weird to think about it in the context of um, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Again, two names are interchangeable, being about God's love for his people, because if you've never read it, it is like it's explicit. It's very um, like sensual in nature, that entire book of the Bible. So for her to be like, yeah, it's a little bit odd. And she was also the one who said um, about how she was just so tired at the end of her wedding day that she was surprised that people would be speaking in tongues. Like she didn't really, from what I remember, again, it's so hard to keep all four voices straight. Um, but like, she didn't really talk about sex being like an act of worship or something where you were speaking in tongues or necessarily listening to like Christian music and praying before they did it the first time. Or they did it before before people had sex the first time. So I think it's interesting that some of them were like, yes, it's a very holy thing. It's an act of worship. People were speaking in tongues. And Emma's pushing back a little bit in, in a very, very subtle way. Honest. Um, so I'd have to ask the Holy Spirit to just, yeah. and I also need to read it in the Passion Translation. Totally. Too. It'll change everything. Um, okay. Because I know it is referring to what you said, fair, it's both ways. Yeah. So yeah. God's love and then the love between a man and a woman. So it is very beautiful and um, something that I'm excited to read the Passion version on. Oh. So. Yeah, like if you just read like one of the verses that I just have saved right here, it's verse 15, I think chapter one, and it's the shepherd king speaking. And he says, my darling, you are so lovely. You are beauty itself to me. Okay. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Wow. Like, oh. and that's how amazing. I've never heard of or read the Passion Translation. I'm assuming it's a separate kind of body of work specifically for this book in the Bible, but I have an NLT Bible, which is the New Living Translation, and my Song of Songs chapter 1 verse 15 says, how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful your eyes are like doves. So, it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's like the same sentiment as her version. It would be interesting to actually go through and see how different it is compared to just a general, you know, like a standard translation of the Bible that is typically used by churches and should speak to you. Yes. Like, come yeah. on. Yes. So, so hold out for a man like that. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Praise God for men of God. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> they can be a little ghetto with it. That's okay. That's okay. We'll take that too. We like a little, sass. Like a little swag and sass. Yeah. <laughs> what? Swag of Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> what? Swag of Solomon. Oh, Lord. We be wild. Moving on. We be oh, my wild. gosh, y'all. Yeah. Where did that even come from? Like, what? What? I, I feel like I missed an entire chunk of something for them to get to that point. Next. Next. Okay. <laughs> what to do if you and your boyfriend keep sexually sinning but cannot get married due to finances? Mm. Ooh. Course, first off. That's tough. For, yeah. I just want to say finances is an excuse. Mm -hmm. I think you can go to the courthouse I think and get you married. Can. I think you can do that. And then later you can have a ceremony. Um, but here's the thing, like I would need to know context. Yes, I, I need to know, are you guys both believers? Yeah. Have you given your life recently to the Lord? Mm -hmm. Have y'all repented? Have y'all sought counsel? Because like sometimes in some instances, you need to separate yourself from yes. this person yeah. for a season yeah. and you need to do some deep heart yes. soul work. Fast. And yeah, fast and pray to break that off and to like truly ask the Holy Spirit to help with self-control because mm -hmm. just putting yourself back into that situation is just awful. So um, I think you need to seek counsel if you haven't already and repent to each other mm -hmm. and then, you know, have some firm boundaries. You can't be in the same bed, you know, you can't lay down. Like, I mean, there's just certain things, you know, that your boundary line is. And if you've already had sex once, it's like, Hey, we need to make a pack. I know Brittany and Jordan, like they had certain things that they, they made sure they wouldn't make out laying down. Right. Like there was certain things. Cause I asked, cause yeah. I'm like, how do you do that? How do you wait? Yeah, we we had rules that that's what I was going to say when there's a will there's a way. Yes. And good. the finances kind of seems like an excuse. Yeah. Like totally. first of all that wasn't Jordan and I, but had it have been, I already know Jordan's response would have been we're going to the courthouse. Yeah. Because that's what if you're this is he's a man of God. Yeah, no, but he's a man of God. Yeah. But yes, it is. If you can't contain it, go get married. Yeah, get married. that's right. Yeah. It's better. Literally. It's, it's yeah, better it's better to you. be right. married it's than goodness. to be living in it's sexual sin. Yeah, yes. in sexual sin. So 
it's what, like probably $40 to get married at the courthouse. Not even that. Yeah. It's it's so quick to go do that. And you don't even have to tell anyone. It, it, if you guys want to wait and have a wedding, that's okay. Like, but when there's a will, there's a way. Also the spirit of self-control. Yes. That's, that is, a, that is fruit. a fruit of the spirit. And so, yeah, I would just say if that is something you guys really want to do, you really have to set boundaries. For us, it was no making out where we were laying down, which is really difficult. <laughs> Let me tell y'all, we had another rule where we couldn't be cozied up on the couch t- together. We would literally lay footsies, like yes. our feet would be touching on opposite ends of the Toes. couch, which sucked. Toes is a go. <laughs> <laughs> it sucked so badly, but it was so good because yes. I knew yes. I was like, yes. if homegirl and homeboy over here laying right next, we yes. know, we know, oh, like Lord. we know where that's going to go. Oh, and so we just... <laughs> The, the one that's not married is over here like, what the heck? Well, mainly because I knew myself, right? I no, was like, yes, I'm a little yes. antagonizer. I will try yes, to push yes. the limits here. And I had cool. to know that going in and be yeah, honest. And just like you said, Kelly, like fast. I had gone through a season before I met Jordan where I had trusted the Lord, fasted from that, and he had delivered me. Why are we laughing? <laughs> Can Why are you laughing? She loves to fast. <laughs> did, you say, did you say you love to fast? No, I'm no I absolutely hate to fast. <laughs> no I'm going to be honest. To fast. If you love fasting, I don't know. Come, the, we can't be friends. I don't fast. I don't Farron understand. Loves to fast. Farron loves it. doesn't we, make we any sense Farron. to me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, squirrel. I, honor I, honor, squirrel. I honor that that you had boundaries and then even tell on yourself to somebody, hey, I'm struggling with this. I need you to keep me accountable. Yeah, totally. I mean, you're you're just setting yourself up for suicide if you and him yeah. are just trying no. to do this in your own strength that's without right. help. That's actually prideful. You know, it's like yes. let some people in because yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. Save some room for Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Put a Bible in the, the, the pillow Bible. If abstaining from sexual activity is something that you value and something that you do want to pursue in your relationship, you'll do it. It, I mean, I kind of agree with it where it's like, well, that's just an excuse that getting married is too expensive. Like if it matters to you, you'll make it happen. And I'm not saying that somebody has to go get married just because they're like feeling sexually aroused and they, and like they're wanting to act on those emotions, like those feelings. I don't know your life. I don't know your situation. I don't know what's good for you. But somebody being like, we just keep falling into sexual sin and we can't get married. What do we do? It's like, yeah, well, you probably have some choices that you could make. There are probably some options. And to be honest, if that is something that you truly are putting as a value, as a priority, there are ways to um, put boundaries in place to make that happen, like to prevent that thing from happening or you could go to the courthouse if it's just a matter of like technically being married for you and you're gonna feel okay as soon as you have that marriage license great but to be honest the way they're talking about like well you could go get married it takes it's like 40 bucks and you can do it quick is that how you think a marriage should be entered into like should it just be well I want to have sex, so we're just going to go have a quickie wedding at the courthouse. And I'm not saying that having, like, a a courthouse wedding is unserious or makes your marriage any less valuable. If that's what you've chosen to do and you just say, like, I don't really care about having a a big wedding. I don't care about the party. Like, I just want to be married to you and I want to make this commitment to you. And that's how you all got married. Great. I love that. Like, I had a super small wedding, just family, a few close friends. It was outside. My dad did the ceremony. So I'm not saying that it has to be like a big production to matter. What I am saying, though, is if you're just rushing into a courthouse marriage so you can feel like you're absolved of any guilt when you have sex, I I don't know if that's a kingdom marriage. I don't know if that is a redemption marriage like Farron was talking about. Like, I don't know that that's the, the heart posture to use a phrase that, you know, religious influencers love. I don't know if that's a heart posture to enter a biblical marriage with of, well, we're just going to do a quickie wedding so we can have sex and not feel bad. You might want to check your motivation for making a lifelong and legal commitment to someone. That rubs me the wrong way that they're just saying like, oh, we'll just go to the courthouse. I don't like that. I would always always 
tell yes, the, the youth. The Sydney one. <laughs> I used to do youth ministry, and anytime the youth, they'd be all cozied up in church. I'd go over to them and I'd tap their shoulders. I'd be like, "Save some room for Jesus." They'd literally look at me with eyes to kill. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. That's yeah, hilarious. that's our take on that question. Yeah. Should we go on to the next one? Yeah. Emma, do you have anything to add? I mean, I would just add, even if you are a virgin and like I said my whole life, like, oh, I'm saving sex for marriage, um, don't go into it thinking it's gonna be easy. Like that was probably Come the on. biggest like self-control yeah. thing that we had to deal with in our dating life. Yeah. So I would just say pray so up for yourself now mm. before you even have a boyfriend or a mm-hmm. fiance. Yes. Like Good. I always just said, and I was like, yeah, I'm just saving myself for marriage. And then when like we were fiancés and it just gets really mm-hmm. challenging. So start praying now. Amen. Just prepare yourself it's good, Emma. Um, for that season. So many juicy nuggets in this episode. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I like this question. Ooh. How to help a low sex drive as a wife. I feel frustrated mm-hmm. with myself and my body so often because of it. Kelly, 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 this sounds like a question for Nurse Kelly. Listen, first off, I want to know how old are you? And I, we just need context. I need you guys to send us some more context for these things. But um, yeah, I first want to know how old are you? Have you gotten your hormones checked? This is just the nurse in me, okay? I just I, I want to make sure everything is optimal on that level. But I also want to know, like, why are you frustrated with your body? Is it just because it's not responding to your husband's sex drive? But then I also want to know, is your husband's sex drive just like super extra? You know what I mean? So there's so many things to this, but, um, and then yeah. past two, past Oh, yes, your past. Yeah, Yeah. we talked about this earlier. Like, did you have a very sexual past and or like impure past? Or did he have a very like, you know. Oh, man, we got off to such a great start where she's like, have you been to a doctor? Have you checked your hormones? Is his sex drive just exceptionally high? Like, let's talk about these things. And then it's going to get into shaming of like, well, did you have a sexually impure past? And so now you have a spiritual block. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe there is something spiritual that is just eating away at this person that's preventing them from feeling like they want to have sex with their husband. But I am willing to bet that it can be attributed to either a hormone imbalance or a like communication and emotional intimacy imbalance. In general, I think for a lot of people, especially women, not to be like stereotypical or heteronormative, um, but but for women in relationships with men, a lot of times, if there's a, an emotional component that's missing, if we don't feel like protected, respected, and taken care of, that can lead to not really wanting to engage in in sex or intimacy with your partner because you're like, I'm missing this thing emotionally, so my body can't really get into it. So like, that's just my first thought. Sexual, because I think porn does a lot. And, and if you don't heal these things before you get married, it kind of just goes over into your marriage. So is yeah. it a situation to where your husband is like kind of making you feel like it's lustful when you have sex and it's not pure and beautiful? Because that would make me not want to have sex. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're treating me like a porn star, I'm not interested, right? Because I am now pure. I am now the bride of Christ right. and and who has made herself ready, right? And so um, I just would love to know more context. But but I think there's definitely hope. I mean, what else yeah. do y'all want to say about this? I, I mean, yeah. yeah. If it is um, just something that is related to your specific body, no pretense, no nothing, then yes, we release this beautiful prayer and come into agreement yes. because God designed it and it is beautiful. Yes. And we are sexual beings. That's yes. the way that yeah. he created us. Yes. That's the way that we create life. Yes. Like what in the world? So like good. God gave that to us to literally make life cool. and it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so even, um, my practical tip would be you and your husband getting together and having a raw and honest conversation. Yeah, Is there good. things that he's doing that you don't like? Is there things, um, but on both sides. So you need to talk about that and then just talk about what you would like, what would be good for you on both ends. Um, and just be like, cause you guys are each other's best yes. friends yeah. and it should be yes. totally open, totally fine to have those conversation. It's not awkward. So we break that yes. off of you right now in the name yes. of Jesus, yeah. Yeah. um, that it's just going to actually bring you closer together being open and honest about that. Yep. I, I have something. 
Yeah, for sure. Have that conversation. Talk about what feels good, what doesn't, what's going to put you in the mood, something that would like make you feel aroused, whatever it may be. Have that conversation. But also, if it is a persistent problem, go to a doctor, like get your hormone levels checked. It could be an imbalance, like a medical imbalance that needs to be corrected. Else that uh, I just felt like I needed to share. So, uh, women are very emotional beings. So, a lot of times, if you aren't being met, like with your emotional needs, and also intimacy, intimacy is different than sex. So, if you aren't having intimacy with your husband, you're probably not going to want to actually have sex with him. And intimacy looks like a lot of different things. I read a book on marriage. It's called His Needs and Her Needs. It's like the best book I've ever read. Um, So I don't know if you would want to read that book, but that really kind of showed me that, wow, it is intimacy first, emotionally engaging first. And then it is actually like, wow, you're loving me so well. And I feel so seen, loved and heard by you that I actually want to give you myself. So that's huge. Yeah, that's so good. Tiny little nugget. When you say intimacy, like we did a a series um, at my church, like we break it down as into me see, right? So like letting them see into you. Yes, good. Yes, still see. Into me see. That's like the catchphrase of a mass murderer. Okay, I've been looking for the specifics of the into me see because I know that that is associated with the children of thunder. I just can't remember if it was a song that they did or like a class or a a way of life. I don't know. But Into Me See, immediately I think of the Helzer brothers who were convicted of five counts of murder. So, um, yeah, when she said like her church did a a series on that, (laughs) that's the first thing that popped into my head. And maybe it's um, not a super well-known reference because, again, when I Googled it, I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for. So. Maybe I cut the church a little bit of slack on that because maybe it's a little bit of a deep cut, but that's the first thing that came to my mind. And heard. Yeah. And so just think of it like, how can I into me see today with the people, not even your marriage, but just like the people around you have to be intimate and how can you make them feel seen? Uh Uh-huh. Um, and we pray that you feel seen in those relationships, yes. I mean, especially Show your that marriage. Like you need, yes. to, you need to have those um, wow. into me see moments. Amen. So yeah, that's totally. just what I was thinking when you said that. Um, yes. that's I love the topic of intimacy and you need that first and foremost to have a great sex life. But a few practical things that you guys feel like, or maybe like the number one practical thing that you guys feel like with your spouse that provokes intimacy, that's mm-hmm. intentional. Oh, intentionality hands down is mine. Like Justin will call me and my husband and he'll be like, how can I serve you today? Is there anyone that like, is there anything I can take off your plate that I can do? Do you need to make phone calls? Like, can I go run an errand for you? Yeah. Yeah, I want to have sex with that. (laughs) But intimacy, like, and he, and so, and he uses that language. Like that's beautiful. It's beautiful. I serve you today. And just that's him laying his life down for his wife. And I'm just like, wow. That's so good. Yes. Okay. For me, it's having like dialogue and conversation without distractions, without phones, because for so long in my life, it was quick, 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 just Mm. using me, you know, one night stands, whatever. And so I never had that connection. So it does something for me when Jordan just has a deep conversation with me. I'm like, what is happening Whoa, right now? I'm like, this is hot. Yeah, yeah. That's so attractive to me. Like yes. intellectual okay. intimacy is so attractive to me. Like if you can have a conversation with your husband that like yes. calls you deeper spiritually, emotionally, you know, mentally, all the things like that just, yeah, that's my thing. Love it. That is so good. I completely agree with Farron and Britt. Like, I love those things. I'll be totally honest. I just want to jump Chance's bones all the time. (laughs) Did I just say that on a podcast? I don't know. We can maybe edit that out. I love his physical self. I'm like, you know? So I love that. But that's so, like, that is surface level. But I am very attracted to my husband. he's physically attracted. I am very attracted to my husband. Listen, if you're not physically attractive, honestly, what would you? Yeah, you need that. You need that, too. You you do need that in a marriage. And, yeah, so, and I know we're all very physically attracted to our husbands. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I think when we go intimate and when, I mean, when I see him, like, praying for Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that 
you have to be physically attracted to somebody in order to enter into a relationship with them. Like that's not the most important thing, but typically that's what draws you to want to start dating somebody in general. So for other people or operating Amen. in like what he's called to do. Um, I'm not trying to say chance is perfect and he's just reading his Bible all the time, but like when he does this stuff or when he like acts of service or just getting in the word of God, there's Amen. nothing more attractive Woo! than that. Yes. So, come on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I yes, love this. So one. Good. That's going to help somebody <laughs> right there. <laughs> Kelly's sweating again. I am sweating y'all. <laughs> okay. So y'all are going to have to wait till okay. next week for oral sex. Cause Ooh! this is going to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> this episode. Thank you so much for listening in today and we will see you guys next week. Bye. 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 So obviously Brittany mentioned part three containing talk about oral sex. Um, I didn't know that there was going to be a part three, but apparently there is. And so I went to look to see if it had been posted yet. Cause I know she's posted um, a few additional episodes since this one that we just listened to, but I don't think she's posted part three because the one after this, um, I had already looked at it and I was like, I, I don't feel comfortable touching that one. Like I don't have the experience or the authority or the knowledge. It's about body dysmorphia and eating disorders. And then I read the description and it says that there is a special guest, Nicoletta. So I don't think that's the one with her friends. And then the one right after that is talking about um, human trafficking and the sound of freedom that movie that came out a few weeks ago that had a lot of controversy around it and I might end up reacting to that one I think I just need to see the movie first um, I, I know some people who have seen it and they thought that it was powerful and important and such a good movie and like they they fully support it at the same time there's a lot of conspiracy talk happening around this movie and I also don't know how much I trust Tim Ballard who's the driving force behind it and additionally one of the people who funded the movie has recently been arrested for the kidnapping of a child so um a lot of controversy around this movie in particular and I don't know that I'll react to that that episode unless I can manage to watch Sound of Freedom and see what actually goes on firsthand. Um, but I'm like, I'm not going to pay to see it in a movie theater. So if it's out on any streaming services, either now or soon, maybe we'll end up talking about it. But I can't talk about something if I haven't seen it. So that's just how I feel about that. Um, at the same time, though, I don't think she's posted part three. If and when she does, if you want me to react to it, I will. I will. I'll take up that challenge. I will put myself through it for you and for the sake of the conversation that we can have surrounding it. So with all that being said, thank you if you made it to the end of this. I know it was a long one. I had a lot to say. They had a lot to say. So a lot of points were covered. I just appreciate you for taking the time to watch or listen to this entire thing with me. I would love to hear your opinions on everything that was discussed throughout the course of this episode. So if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to leave those thoughts in the comment section. And if you are listening to the podcast, you can leave it in the Q&A section for this particular episode. And while you are doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel or leaving the podcast a rating or a review, that would be incredible. If you have done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.